1 Peter chapter number 1, I esteem the chapter of 1 Peter and chapter 1 to be one of the greatest doctrinal chapters in all of the Word of God. It ranks right up there with Ephesians chapter 1 and 2. Ranks right up there with chapters like Romans chapter 8. Just There's so much doctrinal goodness jam-packed in the first chapter of 1 Peter in these 25 verses that, goodness, it'd just take us a whole lot longer than what we've got tonight to be able to preach it to you. Uh, so we're just going to try and preach a few verses out of the first uh, part of this text tonight. Let's read the first several verses together. First Peter chapter number 1, verse number 1. Uh, the Bible said, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Verse 6, wherein? In light of the things he's just got done telling us in the first several verses, wherein, in light of these things, ye don't just rejoice, ye greatly rejoice. You say, preacher, I just read them things with you. What in the world do we have to rejoice about tonight uh, in this wicked world? What do we have to rejoice about tonight in a fledgling, messed up economy that's about to go down? What do we have to rejoice about tonight in a world where there are wars and rumors of wars? What do we have to rejoice about tonight as God's people in a society that is hell bent on uh, ungodliness and immorality? What do we have to rejoice about. Well, in the first several verses, he tells us we can rejoice in a lot of things in light of the fact that we are the elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in light of the fact we are sanctified through the Spirit, in light of the fact we have been sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ, verse 2, in light of the fact we have grace and peace multiplied unto us, verse 2, in light of the fact, verse 3, that we are begotten again unto a lively hope, verse 3, in light of the fact that we have a resurrected Christ, verse Verse 3, in light of the fact that we have an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away in verse 4, in light of the fact that we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation in verse number 5, in light of those things we can greatly rejoice this evening. Can I just remind, can I just say this to you? Uh, this is not rejoicing. <laughs> There, 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 there ain't no such thing as emotionless worship in the Bible. This, this idea, well, I worship God inwardly. That sounds good. There's one problem with it. It ain't in the Bible. Every time somebody starts worshiping or praising God, there will be some outward demonstration of what God is doing on the inside. He said, wherein ye greatly rejoice, and you're going to need to rejoice tonight because of what's coming next. Watch verse number 6. You better learn how to rejoice in these things. You better learn how to rejoice in these unshakable truths, these immutable truths, these unchangeable truths, these infallible truths, these powerful truths, these holy truths, these spiritual truths. You better learn to rejoice in them because of what's coming next. When you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. The, the Apostle Peter said that there are seasons of life and these believers are living in that season right now where they have much heaviness laying on top of their life. And he says that these times of heaviness, he calls it this, Preacher Foster, he calls it seasons. And he even says, if need be, he says that these seasons of heaviness in the Christian life, they are indeed needful tonight. 
I don't like seasons of heaviness. I don't enjoy seasons of heaviness. But I realize and recognize this, that if God does not allow the seasons of heaviness to come through my life, like the choir saying earlier, I will not gain the strength that I need to gain, nor will I appreciate the goodness of God like I should appreciate it tonight. How in the world am I supposed to be a partaker of the things of Jesus Christ if I'm not equally a partaker of His suffering? if I am not acquainted with his suffering, if he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, how in the world can I identify with Jesus Christ if I am not at times in my life acquainted with grief and sorrow as well? Just like there are seasons in our world, just like there are seasons in the different times of the year, winter, spring, and summer, and fall. And I must admit to you, the season we've just came out of is my least favorite season of all. I absolutely hate it when it starts getting dark around 5 and 6 o'clock. It puts me in a mood of depression. I don't like it. I hate it when it starts getting cold outside. and You have to wear jackets and toboggans and gloves and bundle up. I, I don't like that season. I, I look forward to when it gets to like this, when the sun starts popping back out real good and warms up to 75 and 80 degrees. I'd rather sweat than shiver any day of the week. But I realize this. I realize if there are not that season that God ordained of winter time where things can die so that things can regerminate, I realize we'll not have the benefit of enjoyment of spring and summertime. And so God sends that season because He knows exactly what we need and just like that in our life God sends along seasons of discouragement and seasons of depression and seasons when it seems like our prayers are not being answered and seasons when it feels like God is a million miles away there are seasons of the Christian life to where we have heaviness in our life and here he says, if need be, your heaven is through manifold temptation. And watch verse 7. Watch what the seasons allow us to prove in our life. That the trial of your faith, it is, it is a trial of your faith. It is a testing of your faith. Anybody can live for God and shout the victory and be faithful when everything's going good. Anybody can live for God, serve the Lord when there's money in their pocket, health in their body, food in the cabinet, everything's hunky-dory, everything's puppy dogs, rainbows, and cotton candy. Anybody can live for God in times like that. But times of heaviness afford you the opportunity to prove that what you have is more than just a passing fad. It's more than just something you do because it's convenient, but it's something real that's not not just good in the spring and summer of the Christian life but it's good in the dark cold winter times of life as well <laughs> The trial of your faith. And watch what the, how the Lord looks at these seasons of heaviness, these trials of faith. The Bible says, They're much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. We might as well read the next two verses because they're real good. Whom have not seen, ye love, in whom the now you see him not yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory receiving the end of your faith even the salvation of your souls I'd like to preach this evening for a few minutes out of these texts and verse 7 will be our key text tonight where the apostle Peter calls what these believers are battling in their life a trial of faith he says in the middle part that their faith Faith is tried with fire. And tonight I'd like to preach to you on the subject faith under fire. Faith under fire tonight. Somebody said that a faith that can't be tested cannot be trusted tonight. If your faith only works when everything's working, it don't work very well. Faith should be something that works when everything breaks down. When all of the world seems to be against you. When all of hell camps out on your doorstep and yet somehow you can still worship and you can still praise and you can still witness and you can still read your Bible and you can still 
still pray because what you have is something that circumstances did not give and circumstances cannot take away something the world doesn't give and the world doesn't take away something as centered and something that has a bedrock to it may I say my faith is not based in this world my faith does not fluctuate because my faith is not anchored in something that is temporal but my faith is in something and someone that is eternal tonight the Bible said so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God and the Bible said the grass withereth and the flower fadeth but the word of our God shall stand forever and because my faith is in something that God said and not something that man said then my faith is settled my faith is sure my faith tonight is not anchored in this world but the Bible said which hope we have as an anchor of the soul both sure and steadfast and that which entereth to within the veil whither the forerunner is entered for us even Jesus tonight my rope of hope my rope of faith is not anchored down in the things of this world but it is thrown up into the veil behind the third heaven and though the winds of this world may rock my vessel and may toss my vessel and the rains and the storms of this life may rock and toss my mind and my life I'm glad the faith that I live by the faith that Paul said I've lived by the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me it is not rooted in this life it is anchored in another world tonight you say preacher if these people had been going through something like what I'm going through uh, you know this sounds real good but the actual outworking of this doesn't really work out because these people don't got problems like I got oh oh, these people got problems the Bible said there are strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, verse number 1. Do you know why they are scattered and why they are strangers? Because they are fleeing from a madman who is the Caesar at this time. His name is Nero, and Nero is a psycho. Nero is a tyrannical dictator that is a whacked out idiot. If you've ever read about Nero in history books, you'll find he was one of the most psychotic individuals that ever ruled over any country. This man, I'm telling you, was such a decadent, immoral, ungodly, wicked individual that persecuted the church beyond measure in ways unimaginable. This man was such a filthy, ungodly, immoral person that they say in history that his mother put him on the throne, made him the Caesar. After he become a Caesar as a young man, she was a threat to his rule. He had his own mother assassinated. His father first wife that he married when he got tired of her. This is factual history. He had her head cut off and brought to his next wife on a platter. And his next wife, when he got tired of her and she was pregnant with his child, he abused her so brutally and kicked her and beat her up so bad that the baby inside of her died and she died as well. His third marriage was not even to a, a woman at all. It was to a young boy that he dressed up like a woman and he was a person and married this young boy when he got tired of him he had him assassinated and married another young boy he set Rome on fire and made it look like the Christians did it so that he could persecute the Christians and when he persecuted our uh, precious forefathers and foremothers to the death he impaled their bodies on stakes after dipping them in candle wax and lighting them on fire he crucified them on crosses he fed them to hungry animals he fed their babies these to hungry pigs right in front of their eyes and he persecuted them in the most cruelest of fashions and this is the persecution that these people are going through and yet Peter says in the midst of this kind of persecution we think we're persecuted because we're paying four dollars a gallon for gas we think we're persecuted because a nursing home patient is running the country right now we think we're persecuted because everything seems to be upside down and backwards y'all these people really know what persecution is they know what it's like to suffer to the death for being Christians and for believing what I'm preaching tonight and yet Peter said about these people what you've got is more precious than gold what you've got can get you through the trial of your faith what you've got you can still rejoice in you can still shout about you can still lift glad hands about because what you've got doesn't depend on the circumstances it depends on the Savior tonight 
it's, it's a trial of faith, faith under fire tonight. Can I say what I have is real? I like them songs that they all sung about tonight. It kind of seemed like every song kind of pointed this direction about what we have is real. What we have is not fake. I hope you got something real tonight. I want to show you several things about faith under fire. Can I show you just three things real quick about faith under fire and we'll be done tonight. Let me say number one, we see the validity of faith under fire. Faith that is valid tonight. Faith that has validity to it. Something that's real. You say, what makes your faith, Brother Zorn, more valid than anyone else's faith? There are all kind of faiths in the world. What makes your faith more valid than the Muslim's faith? What makes your faith more valid than the Buddhist faith? What makes your faith more valid than the agnostic or the atheist faith? And trust me, they say they don't got faith, but I'm going to tell you in a minute, they got big faith tonight. What makes your faith, Brother Zorn, any different than their faith tonight? And Peter highlights what makes our faith valid this evening. He says what makes our faith valid in verse number 3 is a resurrection makes our faith valid. The resurrection makes our faith valid. We are coming into the season season of the resurrection Sunday of Easter Sunday celebrating the fact that Jesus Christ did not just die but he rose victorious over death hell and the grave Peter said in verse 3 we are begotten again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead somebody would say well preacher that's just blind faith oh no our belief in a resurrection is not blind faith it's not just some uh, pull of straw out of the deck or out of the hat and act like maybe it happened oh no my Bible said this that Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 1 showed himself alive by many infallible proofs let me pause right here before I go on what I'm fixing to say and say this if you got something beside a King James Bible most of your other Bibles change infallible proofs to convincing proofs that's a big difference tonight I can convince you of something that's not true people are convinced all the time of something that's not real but something that is infallible that's true whether you believe it or not it's true whether you're convinced of it or not Jesus Christ rising from the dead is not some convincing parlor trick by some Jew that was slick and able to hoodwink a bunch of people it was the infallible truth of eyewitnesses that saw it tonight the Bible said that Jesus Christ was seen of above 500 brethren after his resurrection 500 y'all 500 people walks into a courtroom and testifies that they were all eyewitnesses to something that's the gospel do you all realize tonight there are more people that saw Jesus Christ alive after his crucifixion and death than there were that saw Abraham Lincoln assassinated in the Ford Theater by John Wilkes Booth? There wasn't as many people saw John Wilkes Booth shoot the 16th president in the back of the head and jump off the stage and holler six emperor tyrannus as there was saw Jesus Christ alive in his glorified body after he has risen from the grave. Everybody in here believes the 16th president was shot by John Wilkes Booth, right? Sure you do. Sure he was. Brother, I'm telling you, we got something more infallible than that. 500 people see it and attest to it, and then it goes beyond that. Then most of all of those people, most of all those people were tortured to death because of that faith. You read your history. Not one of them in the midst of their torture ever said, All right. I confess, it's all a big ruse. We stole him. He just swooned. He didn't really die. He just kind of passed out, and we brought him back to life. No, no, no. 500 of them all witnessed under persecution and torture that what we saw was real and he really was alive. You know what makes our faith valid tonight is we don't just have a dead Savior. We have a living Savior tonight and he is alive and he is able to save and he does sit at the right hand of the throne of God. And what makes our faith real is a resurrection tonight. Not only of validity of faith, uh, our resurrection gives validity to our faith. But then he says there is a reservation that gives validity to our faith. Verse number four, 
He said we have an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, watch it, watch it, reserved in heaven for you, y'all. I ain't hoping to go to heaven. I ain't thinking I'm going to heaven. I ain't coin toss 50 50 good works outweigh the bad works. No, sir. I got something reserved for me tonight. Got my name on it. Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place, I will come again and receive you unto myself. To where I am, there you may be also. I got something reserved on me. Now, you might be sending up boards to build your mansion, you know, one by one and all that. Not me, sir. I got something reserved tonight. He ain't giving it away. He ain't giving it away to somebody else. It's been bought and it's been paid for. And it is mine right where I stand tonight. Reservation, resurrection. There is a redemption that gives validity to my faith. Verse number five said this, who are kept, I love the next few words, by the power of God. Y'all, I ain't holding on to Jesus. Jesus is holding on to me. You can hold on and hold out and endure to the end all you want. I'm resting in the good grace of Jesus tonight. Said we're kept by the power of God. Here's our word again through faith <laughs> unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. You know what gives validity to my faith? I'm saved tonight. Amen. You say, how do you know that you're saved? Because I have the witness of the Holy Spirit living on the inside that lets me know I am the child of God. You say, how do you know that? You just got to get saved and try her out. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know, that you may know, that you may know that you have eternal life. I'm not hoping I'm saved. I ain't thinking I'm saved. I'm saved tonight. It gives validity to my faith faith. Do you realize Bible-believing Baptists are the only group of people on the face of the planet that believe that you are saved by grace through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ plus nothing, minus nothing, and you can't lose it? We don't believe baptism got anything to do with you getting to heaven. We don't believe confirmation helps you in any meritorious fashion. We don't believe in praying to St. Paul and St. Mary and St. John and St. Luke nor St. nobody else. We believe tonight that a man is justified fully in the sight of God through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ and that a man is kept not by his own works or his own power but kept by the grace of God. It makes what we've got value tonight hey, amen people people hear me preach about stuff like this and high minded people in the world say well that's just that's just fanciful ideas you know and you just you know that's just big faith oh no 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 I got little bitty faith I do I got little bitty faith I'm I'm real weak in faith I am I tell you who's got big faith People that believe that billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of years ago. Our children are in this big old dark black expanse of a void universe. Two hydrogen dust balls got to swirling around. Yeah, yeah, people believe what I'm fixing to tell you. What I'm fixing to tell you is the atheist gospel. The evolutionist gospel. It's a fairy tale for adults. Yeah. And these, they don't, they got no clue where the gas or where the dust or anything come from to make these things. They just by faith assume, Brother Lancaster, that they, they just started swirling and they started running. And out there in that great, big, dark, black expanse of a universe, them two big dust balls got bigger and bigger, and after a while they picked up so much matter and so much energy, they run into each other. And when they run into each other, Brother Jordan, they blowed up. And after they blowed up, after that big old bang, out flung everything that you see and the things you don't see. I mean, it all got flung out there. I mean, our, our, our earth come flying out of there is a big blob of water. <laughs> a big explosion, big blob of water come out of, okay. 
And, and, and it started orbiting our sun at 1G of gravity. Got just far enough away so it don't heat to death, just close enough so it don't freeze to death. I mean, it all just got set up in perfect symmetry. And after that water started drying up there on that little globe called Earth, I mean, as it started drying up into little mud holes, after a few billion years, life began to form in the form of a tiny one-cell amoeba. And he was a positive thinker. This little one cell of me that was a positive figure. He said, if I can believe it, I can achieve it. And after a few billion years of being a tadpole, he sprouted legs and become a frog. And he hopped around for a few million years like a frog. And one day he looked up in them trees and he seen them coconuts and them bananas and he said, mm -mm, I'd sure like to have me some of them. And so after a few million years of being a frog, he finally fought harder and fought harder. And he finally grew arms and legs and fur and a tail and he become a monkey. And he crawled in them trees, got some coconuts and bananas. And then after a few million years of being a monkey, he started walking a little straighter and walking a little straighter and he become a bigger monkey and a bigger monkey till one day he become a man and he, and he got him a little girlfriend that the scientists all the scientists called this dude's girlfriend Eve steal, steal material from somewhere else would you don't steal it from my book you don't believe my book go get your call her Jane or Susie or somebody or something don't call her Eve that's from my book that's from a simple minded little oaf that ain't got sense enough to get out to rain Anyways, he grabbed his little girlfriend, Navy Eve. They walked up into a cave and they built fire and ooh, fire and drew pictures on the wall and all that. You know, Neanderthal man. And finally one day he walked out of that place and he had a three-piece suit on and a pair of spectacles on. He walked up into colleges and universities and he said, man has become the measure of all things. We have reached the top of the evolutionary process. Nothing is higher than us. Nothing's going farther than us. We've reached the very top. Now y'all, if you believe that tonight, you need to sue your brain for non-support. Lord, hey, something bad wrong with you. I'm telling you, brother, that's absolutely insanity tonight. If, if you believe that, you really should get saved because you got great big faith. You got mountain moving faith. With faith like that, there ain't no telling what you could do for God. You could do something awesome for God with big old faith like that. I got such little bitty faith, preacher Foster, that I had to believe that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and nursed without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. God said, let it be light and there was light and everything we see come from the hand of a mighty creator and a wonderful good God you say what gives your faith validity uh, brother that book gives my faith validity tonight I'll never forget years, years ago I, I'm, I'm still a poor old dumb country boy but when I was uh, 20, 21, 22 years old I was a real dumb country boy that ain't never been nowhere from southeast Georgia and, and, and I'd been invited to go preach in San Antonio, Texas. I just got married, and my wife and I flew out to San Antonio, and they give us a little car to drive around. And one day while we was down there, we decided to go sightseeing and such as that. And we went to the River Street Mall, the River Center Mall, was right behind the Alamo out there and all. And we pulled up into this parking garage. I've never been anywhere like this. And I pulled up in this parking garage, and the fella handed me a, a parking ticket. And he said, Now, sir... You can pay this ticket when you come out or there's a certain store in this mall. And he told me what the name of it was. I can't remember now. And he said, if you'll go in that one particular store, they'll validate your parking. I said, I, what, what, what does that mean? He said, well, basically what it means, if you take this ticket in that store, they'll validate your parking where you don't got to pay for it when you go out. They're just trying to get people in the store. If you get in the store, they'll punch it. You don't got to pay for it when you go out. I said, sounds good to me. I'm all for something free. And so we walked around the place for a while and shopped and ate and all that. And I said, well, Tristan, we fixing to leave. I want to get this parking validated. So we found that certain store. And I walked in there and I thought, this is going to sound stupid. They're not going to know what I'm talking about. And I walked up to the lady at the counter and I pulled it out. And I said, ma'am, this fellow out in the garage said that if I'd bring this in here, she said, no problem, I'll validate it for you. She grabbed it out of my hand. She punched it, did what she did to it. She handed it back. She said, no, you just give it to the attendant on the way out and it won't cost you anything. I said, God bless you. And I walked out there, got in the car and I was fixing to pull out and I thought this ain't going to work. This is the dumbest thing I ever heard. I'm still going to have to pay for this and wasted my time. But sure enough, I pulled up that feller at the, at the little arm gate there. I had him my ticket and he looked at it and he said, uh, have a nice day, sir. I said, I don't owe you nothing. He said, no, your ticket's been validated. You don't owe me anything. And he let me out of that thing and I drove off just scot-free. And I thought to myself, the only way, the only 
reason why I got out of there without having to pay a penalty was because I went to a certain one and only place that could take care of the price of what I had to pay and pay and validate what I had. You say, what makes your faith valid? Because somebody paid for me. <laughs> Thank you. you want a real faith? It's got to get validated. You know where faith gets validated? Faith don't get validated in religion. All kind of people got faith in religion. That ain't going to help you. All kind of people got faith in, in, in education. That ain't going to help you. All kind of people got faith in, in careers and in money. That ain't going to help you. But if you'll ever go to the one that said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, I'm glad he validates faith tonight. Faith validity, faith under fire. We say faith that's valid. Can I see also the, this faith under fire? We see faith not only that uh, has validity to it, but faith that is valuable. Faith is valuable. I love these word pictures in your Bible. Look at verse number 7. Verse number 7, he said, The trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire. Here we find that the writer under inspiration of the Holy Ghost is giving us a type. He's giving us a picture. He's saying that faith has some similarities to gold. Only faith is much more precious than gold that perishes. When I read that one day, Preacher Foster, I thought, man, if there's some similarities between faith and gold, I want to know what makes my faith valuable. There got to be something in gold. And son, the more I got to reading about gold, I was not disappointed when I saw the pictures and the types. They say several things about gold that makes it valuable, and I immediately thought of our faith. They say that faith or gold, excuse me, that's real, shines consistently. Shines consistently. Now let me pause and say this. They do say that there is a difference and you got to be careful because there's such a thing as real gold and there's such a thing as fool's gold. It kind of looks the same and it kind of feels the same, but it ain't the same because it's worthless. And they said real gold shines consistently. They said in those old days when those miners would mine gold out of the earth, old 49er days and such as that, like in the gold rush in California, they'd mine that gold out. One of the ways they would tell if it was real or if it was fool's gold is they would take that piece of gold and they would hold it up to the light. And the closer they got it to the light, the light would show if it was real or not. They said real gold shines consistently. It doesn't matter which angle you hold it. It doesn't matter which attitude you put it in. It'll just shine, shine, shine. They said, but fool's gold doesn't shine. Fool's gold glitters. And when you put fool's gold up to the light, it will glitter and gleam momentarily, but you turn it a little different, and it goes dark. Turn it a little bit farther, and it glitters. Turn it a little more, and it goes dark. It is not consistent in it shine. Son, I got to reading that and I thought that's what faith is. Real faith shines consistently. It doesn't matter what area you put it in. It doesn't matter what attitude you put it in. It doesn't matter what circumstance you put it in. It'll just shine, shine, shine. You know what reveals if it's real or not? It said the light did. The closer you hold, thy words the lamp to my feet and the light to my path. The closer you hold what you got up up to the light. See, some people don't like Bible preaching. You know why? Because it exposes if what you have is real or fake. You know why a lot of people like to go to these churches now? That they major on worship. Now I use that term real loosely. Worship and singing that elicit an emotional response where they dim the lights down and set the mood and, and, and get it just right and, and, and get, a, get, a, get a mood going and get a sway going. You know why people like that and then very, very little on Bible preaching? Because what they got ain't real. There ain't no such church as that in the Bible. Churches in the Bible centered around Bible preaching. Why? 
because it would reveal what's real and what's fake. It would highlight what's real and what's not. And when Bible preaching starts like I'm doing tonight, it shouldn't discourage you. It shouldn't put fear in your heart. It should put joy in your heart saying, I know I got that right there. That bears witness with me because the author of that lives inside of me. If Bible preaching bothers you, maybe it's because what you've got is fake tonight. It shines consistently. Isn't that our job? Yeah, we used to sing that song. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine. That's our job. Paul said so in Philippians chapter number 2. Paul said that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked, perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. He said it don't matter how crooked and how perverse the nation gets, your job is simply to shine consistently. See, your faith under fire, it'll just shine consistently. A real faith, you ain't got to try and make it shine. It just does. Do you realize if you're saved, you ain't got to work at the Christian life? If you're saved, the Christian life should come natural because something has moved inside that's real. It should be natural to want to pray. It should be natural to want to come to church and fellowship with believers. It should be natural to want to read your Bible. It should be natural to want to tell somebody else, Preacher Foster, I never read one time in all the Gospels when Jesus cleansed lepers, healed blind people, raised lame people, saved dead people. I never read one time where as soon as he raised them up, he had to have a 12-week course on soul winning to teach them how to go tell somebody about Jesus. What I read was, as soon as they got up from the dead, as soon as they got cleansed from leprosy, as soon as the devils got out, as soon as they stood up and started walking, as soon as sight come back and they started seeing, Jesus had to tell them not to go tell. And they didn't listen to him. Every time Jesus said, you just go show yourself to preach and don't say nothing, they immediately run back home and told everybody what Jesus had done. Nobody had to tell the woman at the well, now look, look, let me tell you something here, honey. Let me tell you something here, honey. Now what you need to do now, now what you need to do is you need to go back home and start telling all them fellas you've been shacked up with, tell them all that Jesus done something for you. Oh, no, 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 no. She got something real on the inside and she just run on back and started telling everybody. It just shined consistently. <laughs> Real valuable faith under fire shines consistently. Can I say this secondly? Real faith under fire is strong constantly. Strong constantly. I was, I was reading, they said they did another test to see if what, was, what, what they got was real or fake, and they called it the hardness test. And they said they would take that piece of gold and they put it there because they say real gold can be dented, real gold can be bent, but real gold won't break. They said you can beat real gold into a sheet so thin you can see through it. They said, I was reading behind gold people now, not, 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 not Bible authors, gold people. And gold people said you can beat real gold into a cord so thin. Listen to this. One ounce of real gold can be stretched in a cord so thin that it, one ounce of real gold can be stretched up to 40 miles long. That, that, that factual, look it up, see if I'm telling you the truth. One ounce can be stretched up to 40 miles long. It, it don't take much to go a long ways. Wow. Isn't that what Jesus said? Yeah. Jesus said if you had faith as the grain of a mustard seed, not the mustard seed, the grain of the mustard seed, which is the pot inside the mustard seed, microscopic. He said if you just had little bitty faith in a mighty big God, there ain't no telling what could go on in your life. Big faith in something little adds up to nothing. Little faith in something big adds up to something. It said it, it's, it's strong constantly. They would beat it. And the more they beat it, it would, make, it would make them know for sure whether it's real or not. But they said, fool's gold, when you hit it, it'll just break into a million pieces. Fool's gold is brittle. It won't hold together. See, see, 
See, I know some people that it don't take much of a from the devil. And they just gone, gone. Can't find them with a CNI and I dog and the FBI and the CIA. Gone, gone, gone. But then I watch some people. Brother Foster, I watch some people. Brother Jackson, I watch some people in our church that I've had the privilege to pastor for four, for four years. And I've watched in four years them just get beat on and beat on and beat on. And yet they keep walking themselves right back into church, singing in the choir, raising their hands and testifying and saying how good God's been to them. And I say, man, that's something real. Right, right. That's real. That's, that's something I want. That's, that's what I got, something real. I read about a fellow like that one time. His name was Job. You ever read the 42 chapters of Job? It's slightly depressing. It is, you, especially for 41 of them. 41 of them, <laughs> depressing. Yeah, old Job, everything's going hunky-dory for his life, and the devil comes by and says to the Lord, uh, uh, I've been walking to and fro on the earth up and down in it, and the Lord said, uh, you ever checked out my servant Job? Have you considered him? Y'all do realize it was not the devil that started Job's problems. It was God. <laughs> I'd just as soon when the Lord and the devil's talking, I'd just as soon the Lord keep my name out the conversation. <laughs> just don't even, don't even bring me up. <laughs> just don't even bring Zorn up. He said, if you consider my servant Job, and the devil said, yeah, I know who that cat is, but I can't get to him. You've blessed him and then put a hedge around him. I can't touch him. But I'll tell you this. If you'll take that hedge away, put your hand on him, he'll curse you to your face because what Job's got is fake. See, God, all Job's got is just something that's good when everything's good. What old Job's got is fake. And the Lord said, you know what the book of Job essentially is? I mean, for lack of a better term, can I just tell it to you in South Georgia redneck? For lack of a better term, the book of Job's a contest between God and the devil. The devil said what he's got is fake, and I'm going to break him. And God says, no, you ain't, because I know what he's got in there, because I put it in there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Can I pause and say this? Do y'all know that every piece of gold in planet earth, it was put there by God? Yeah. And, every, and every piece of faith gold, it was put there by God? Yeah. He knows. And the devil says, challenge on. Challenge accepted. The Lord says, all right, beat on him. Just don't kill him. And the devil says, I got this. Bam! It's all, I mean, brother, bam. His finances is gone. The messengers start coming. Hey, the Sabaeans fell on your servants. They got all your camels and all your donkeys and all your oxes and, and everything. I mean, Job, all your finances, it's just all gone. It's, it's gone about that time. Bam! Somebody else comes by and says, Job, all your youngins was over there feasting in their eldest brother's house and the four winds from the woods come and hit that house and it fell on all of them. Job, I hate to tell you this, but didn't none of them make it out of that thing alive? All ten of your babies is dead, Job. We got to have a funeral for ten folk. About that time, bam! Job's old wife walks up and says, Hey, won't you just curse God and die? Just curse God and die. <laughs> Bam! He smote with sore balls from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. Sits in the ash heap. He's scraping all the sores. And about that time, bam! His four friends come by and start throwing accusing fingers and saying, Job, if you'd have been right with God, this wouldn't happen to you. And I'm telling you, Job's getting beat on and beat on and beat on and beat on. And finally, old Job just sits down in the ash heap, broken. The devil's sitting on one shoulder, his friends is on the other shoulder, and Job sits there. And about middle ways through the book of Job, Job gets about as honest as any man's ever got with God. About middle ways through the book of Job, Job says, I have looked for the Lord everywhere and I cannot find him. He said, on my left hand and on my right hand and I don't perceive him. Behind me and in front of me and I, I can't find him. And I imagine the devil was sitting over there somewhere and saying, that's a real good start, Job. Keep it up. He fitting to curse you. Are you listening? It's coming. And old Job sits there, beat up, broke up, tore up. And about that time, Job draws him down a double lung full of breath and he stands up and he says, but 
He knoweth the way that I take. And when he hath tried me, when this beating's over with, when the heaviness is over with, when the trial of fire is over with, when, when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Job said, what I got's real. What I got ain't fake. And when it's over with, I'll still retain my integrity. The Lord gave and the Lord took away. Blessed be the good name of the Lord. I know that my Redeemer still lives. I know he's still got it in control. Yes, I'm hurt. Yes, I'm broke. But I've got something real tonight. Some real, real faith. It shines consistently. It's strong constantly. Can I say this and I'll run to the end? It can be scorched completely. Scorched completely. They say another test they would do on that gold is they do what's called the fire test, the scorching test. They take a piece of gold, they put it in a skillet or a pot and heat it up. And they said if it's real gold, real gold doesn't get worse by fire. Real gold gets better by fire. And they even said this, real gold will even emit a pleasant odor as it gets hot. And all fire does is just burn off everything the world had put on it. But fool's gold is not so. Brother James, they say that fool's gold, when you put it in one of those pots and you heat it up, it gets darker and dingier. And then on top of that, they say it emits a stinking sulfur-like smell. Fool's gold, when it gets hot, starts to smell like rotten eggs. Fool's gold, it gets hot and you smell it, it stinks. You know, like some people that ain't got the real thing. Get in the fire and the testimony stinks. The attitude stinks. The talk stinks. I mean, it just, it just all stinks. I read about some old boys that got in the fire one time. And the king thought what they had was fool's gold too, but it weren't. They looked at him in Daniel chapter 3 and old Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, Let us tell you something, Jack. Be it known unto the old king. Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us out of the burning fiery furnace out of our hand. But if not, we will not bow to your gods. Chunk them in the fire. See how they like that. And in they went. And brother, when they got in there, what, they, what he thought was going to be fool's gold going to burn up instead, it didn't make it worse, it made them better. They got in that fire and all the fire did is it got them closer to Jesus and it burned off the bonds that was on their hands. And old Neb looked over in that fire and old Nebuchadnezzar, he said, uh, y'all, that's the Cody's arm version, y'all, that's what he'd have said if he was from where I'm from. Y'all, didn't we throw three fellas in that fire? And they said, yes sir, that's exactly what we've done. He said, and how come I'm counting four? Daniel 3, 25. And the form of the fourth is like... Now, if you got NIV, ESV, ASV, NLT, then what your Bible says is the form of the fourth is like the son of the gods. Whoever that is. That's, that's Thor or Zeus or something like that. I have no idea who, who the son of the gods is. But that ain't what Neb said. Nebuchadnezzar said in my Bible, the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. I know who that is. That's Jesus. Oh, I get so fed up with all a bunch of nasty nerds out there. Well, all the Bible correctors and all this stuff trying to shoot holes in your book. Well, how did the pagan king know that it was the Son of God? He was a pagan. Have you not read the rest of the chapter and the next chapter? That's called divine revelation, honey. He starts worshiping the God of heaven. Yeah, you didn't know who the Son of God was either until God revealed it to you. Amen. And brother, what they had was able to be scorched completely. It was valuable. I wonder if what you've got so valuable that it can be scorched completely, that it can be strong constantly, and that it can shine consistently. Because that's something valuable. Faith under fire, the value of it, the validity of it. And lastly, we find faith under fire, we'll see the verdict of it. 
the verdict of faith under fire. Watch what it said in verse number 7. Watch, watch the end of this. He said that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, watch, I like these wordings, might be found. See, he's already used the word in verse 7, trial. That's an examination. We're going to get to the bottom of this. That's what a trial is for. But then we see the word found, it literally carries the exam, uh, 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 indication that we're going to get the verdict. You're not going to be able to hide the verdict. Might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. The verdict will come in one day on our faith. The verdict will be found out. You won't be able to hide it. The verdict will be final. You won't be able to change it. You're going to do something for Jesus Christ? You better do it now. It's going to be too late to do it when you stand before Him. How many of us are going to stand before Him ashamed and say, man, I wish I'd have lived for Jesus. I wish I hadn't have quit going through that. I wish I hadn't have just threw the towel in. I wish I'd have just kept praying and serving and worshiping. And the, and the verdict will not only be final, and all will be found out, but the verdict will be in his favor. Yeah, yeah. See, the, see, the verdict ain't in your favor. Did you notice that? The whole point of living a life of faith that can be tried, faith under fire, is not to bring you glory. It's all about bringing... Did you notice it? Verse 7. It said that it might be found unto praise, honor, glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. You say, who does the praise go to? Who does the honor go to? Who does the glory go to? Newsflash, it ain't you. When it's all said and done, we ain't going to dance around heaven like a bunch of prima donnas and say, Ooh, look what we've done. No, 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 no. If you did survive the fires, if you did come through the heartache and the heartbreaks, if you did withstand the beatings of the devil, can I say, it was just him working through you. It was only because of him. It weren't because of us. It was because he had moved in us, lived inside of us, and gave us something worth living for. Four to nine. Amen. You know how this whole thing's going to turn out. This, 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 these, this, um, this faith under fire. According to the apostle Paul, it turns out in crowns, incorruptible crown, crown of rejoicing, crown of life. Five of them that Paul and Peter speaks of. All through there, these different crowns that the Christian can earn. Not earning salvation. Not working to get saved. Working because we are saved. You can't, you can't earn redemption. You can earn rewards. You can't lose redemption. You can lose rewards. You know how these things are going to turn out? They're going to turn out in crowns. And the Bible said according to 1 Corinthians and according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that the, these things are going to be wood, hay, stubble, or gold, silver, precious stones. That ties you back into that faith under fire. Something that's real. And whatever was real and done for the glory of Jesus Christ will abide the fire. And the Bible said that one of these days the saints of God are going according to Revelation chapter number 4. They're going to take their crowns off their head and cast them before the feet of the one that sat on the throne and say, worthy, worthy, worthy. You realize the crown is not for you to keep. I'm not trying to win something so that I... The old song used to say, we're going to put on a crown and walk around all over God's promised land. I'm sorry, it ain't going to happen. The crown ain't yours. It ain't for you to keep. It ain't for you to wear. The crown is to be able to throw it at his feet as a token of our appreciation for what he's done for us. And I read that thing for years, Brother Foster, and I wondered to myself, the Bible said they threw him through the crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy. And I wondered what happens to them after that. Where they go after that? And I read commentaries and searched books and never could find anybody that said nothing. After that, crowns is over with. Nobody said nothing about it. 
And I was reading the Bible one day and I read down through Revelation chapter number 19 when Jesus comes back to rule and to reign after the tribulation. And the Bible said, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and him that sat upon him whose faith the earth and the heaven fled away and the Bible said his name was called the word of God and in righteousness he doth judge and make war his eyes were as a flame of fire listen to what he said about him and on his hand were many crowns I read that and I said as far as I know Jesus ain't got but one head but he's wearing many crowns how's that possible and the Holy Ghost spoke to my heart and he said, Zorn, you remember all them crowns that was left over there at the throne in Revelation 4? I said, yeah. He said, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen to them. God's going to come along and scoop all them crowns up and all the crowns that the saints of God have won for him down through the ages, he's going to fashion them into one glorious crown that will set upon his kingly brow. And y'all listen here, I about turned cartwheels in my office because it hit me like this. The first time he came, he wore my crown of thorns, which was my crown of the curse. That crown of thorns was because of the curse of mankind. That was mine. But to the second time he comes he'll not wear my crown of the curse but he'll wear my crown that I won for him for being a Christian and a child of God and if it be so that he'll wear a crown that I've won for him then I want to fashion him the most glorious crown the most beautiful crown the most wonderful crown cause he deserves it tonight Amen. it'd be worth it all one day Oft times the day seems long, and our trials hard to bear. We're tempted to complain, to murmur and despair. But Christ will soon appear, and He'll catch His bride away. And all tears forever over in God's eternal day. And it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of His dear face, no sorrows will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. Do you got a faith that can be put in a fire? Would you help me up here, Sister Brother James? Y'all come give us something. I wonder tonight, do you have a faith that can be tested? Do you have a faith that's rooted in something real? You say, Preacher, I don't got something real. Tonight, won't you get something real? Tonight, maybe you've been deceived by the lies of the devil and the lies of this world telling you that the Bible's not true, Christianity's not real. The devil's deceived you tonight. Why don't you run to something real and trust Christ? In simple childlike faith, trust what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross, that He was died and was buried and He rose again. And tonight, maybe you are in a trial and a season of heaviness. You say, what's a good prayer after a message like that? For a Christian, here's a good prayer after a message like this. Lord, increase my faith. Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Let's all stand tonight. Father, I pray you'd bless the simple message from your word. Use it to be a help. Use it to be a minister to your people. And we'll thank you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.